Uh, so we continue with a talk by Arif Ophir. Yeah, go ahead. Hello. Today I would like to talk to you about the transit timing variations in the Kepler's data, uh, specifically a few, a few projects that I've been doing, doing with uh, Stefan Reitzler, Karolyn von Essen, and uh, Tamás Bokovic. I would uh, first give you a very brief history. Very brief history of TTVs, as you've already heard uh, a few speakers uh, talk about that, and uh, talk about two objects and KOI net and conclude. So, uh, TTVs were first theoretically predicted by in two important works uh, in back 2005. First of them was well, by uh, Holman and Murray, which predicted transit time variation due to planet planet interaction, meaning the exchange of angular momentum between planets. And you can later you could see in observation how one, as one planet accelerates, the other planet decelerates. Really, the global angular momentum preserved, but the, uh, some of it is exchanged between the planets. Another work that was done uh, in this year was by Egol et al. that also included indirect interaction or indirect TTVs, meaning that the TTVs are caused by the uh, transit of the star, but because the star moves around the barycentric with the other planet, you see TTVs. So this is indirect TTVs. TTVs were first observed by in the Kepler-9 system, which is very important, but I will talk about it in detail later. And the important concept to understand is mean motion resonance, which is the uh, when the periods between the period ratio between the two planets is close to the uh, ratio of two small integers. This, this enhances the TTV signals. Therefore, all known uh, TTV bearing planets are near mean, mean motion resonances, uh, although they are just a small fraction of the multiple systems in general. Most systems are far from mean motion, mean motion resonances. So, Kepler-9, a very important system, because it's the first system to exhibit multi-transiting system, and the first system to show TTVs both in the same place. And it was uh, shown by Holman et al. to show that if you don't take TTVs into account, the transits don't f line up nicely, but if you do, they do. Uh, Holman et al. solved the, for the system uh, completely using both the photometry and uh, the head and radial velocity, and they produced a prediction for the remainder of the mission, of the Kepler mission as was uh, seen at the time, for what the TTVs would look like. And they were quite dramatic. The, the TTVs were predicted to be over a week long. Uh, what I'm going to do now is to overplot the observed TTVs, as Kepler had uh, observed them. And you can see that the, indeed the general shape is similar. Uh, the general shape is determined by the TTV order. So this is not a big surprise. What is surprising is that the Amplitude and the time scale are very, very different from the predicted model. An order of magnitude, smaller amplitude, and about half the time scale. And therefore, the system needed to be revisited and revisit revisited it with much more data that was available near the end of the mission. And the masses that we obtained are significantly lower and the radio is slightly higher. And in, com in total, the density of the planet are one third of the values that arrived by Holman et al. And we did that using photometry alone, without using radial velocity. Why didn't we do use radial velocity? Because, because it is incompatible. If you look at the model of the radial velocity in solid line, and the observed radial velocity uh, measurements, and the residuals on the right, you see that the residuals are very, very systematic. So maybe there are other components in, in the system that uh, are not modeled uh, right now. Uh, therefore, we did not use uh, radial velocity. And it's likely not used to do it. So, why, why are the two analyses so different? We argue that it is because the interaction time scale was not yet covered by the data that was available to Holman et al. And I would like to convince you that this is uh, the correct interpretation. What we have today is the full Kepler data set that includes 68 transits of Kepler 9b, 36 transits of Kepler 9c, spread over 1400 days. Now, we can uh, bisect or take subsets of these data sets uh, in different ways. For example, we can take the partial data set, which is the data set that was available to uh, Holman et al. back in 2010. And while we were able to set the mass of planet C to be 31 Earth masses plus minus 1, with the partial data set, all you could do was to say that it is somewhere in the planetary range, plus or minus, uh, more than order of magnitude in log scale. So the 
result is really dramatic uh, in the capability to, capability to de describe the planet. Now, the question is, what if we took a dilute data set, meaning the same data number of data points as Coleman et al. had, but spread over the entire 1400 days? What kind of constraints would this po pose on the mass of planet C, or in general on the system? What he found out is that this fit, fitting to this data, gives just 33 plus minus 2 Earth mass to planet C, meaning that what the important here is not that we have six times more data, is that we have much more span to the data. Another system that I want to discuss is Kepler-117. Uh, this is one, one of the very first multi-transiting systems that was uh, detected, and was recently validated statistically by Rho et al. It has two planets with a period of 18 and 50 days, uh, showing clear transits. Uh, there are no long-term TTVs, no low-order mean motion resonances, uh, the Transit timing variations of Kepler of uh, 117c is basically flat, and the uh, timing variations of planet B are more or less flat, but with excess scatter. Now, uh, what one could do when you look at this excess scatter uh, O minus C diagram is to do a Fourier analysis or Lomb's current analysis, and one finds that there are exactly three significant periods that exist in this data. Specifically, if you look closely, the dashed line is not at the peak of the highest peak, but it is something else. It is the period of planet C. So the TTVs of planet B have a very strong component in the period of planet C. The question is, and indeed if you phase the, 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 or when you see the timing curve, you see a very unusual and very strong uh, timing signal in the data. So these are the TTVs of planet B, phase with the period of planet C. Why? So the first thing that one can do is just do the same trick we just did with Kepler-9, is do an n-body fit and get a masses for two Jupiter masses for the outer planet and two Neptune masses for the inner planet. And luckily we have, uh, there is also, it was, I didn't know about that, but poster 102 in this uh, conference also should, uh, presented analysis of the same system with the same results. So agreement. Um, but this does not tell us anything why we have exactly three frequencies in the data. If we indeed decompose the TTV signal harmonically, we find that you describe the signal perfectly using the signal of the period of planet C and its first two harmonics. And we still don't understand what are the three frequencies stand, what do all three frequencies stand for. But we have a toy model at least for the first one. The first toy model is just what Egel et al. suggested, is that the barycentric motion of the star, uh, the, the star motion around, along the, uh, around the barycentric of the entire system, specifically uh, because of planet C, is just sampled by the transits of planet B. And what you see as TTVs is just the location X of, planet, of the star in this orbit, and the time it takes for planet B to get there, which is the velocity of planet B. And this toy model predicts the amplitude and phase of the TTVs very nicely. So this is maybe the first uh, system with a significant, if not dominant, interaction component of indirect interaction. This is important because these kind of effects are most powerful when the outer planet is massive and long period. For example, in the solar system we have Jupiter, and the TTVs for an external observer because of Jupiter would be for Earth of seven hours. That's quite a lot. And if you take rather velocity surveys that are less at least less biased for long periods, you see that there are a very, very large number of massive, large, uh, large, uh, large orbit planets that obviously cause these kinds of TTVs to all the inner planets. Final subject that I want to discuss is KYNet. Well, Kepler-9 just taught us that increasing the baseline of, data, of the, our data sets is important. Long period systems like Kepler-87 that has periods of almost 200 days, Kepler-90 that has periods of over 300 days, and exhibiting TTVs showed us that sometimes we have long periods of planets, long period planets, the TTV curve is just undersampled. You don't have enough data points. Sometimes you do have enough data points, but the shape is not yet clear because you don't have enough time. And you have quite a number, uh, quite a number of data points in this system, 
but you don't know if it's a parab parabola or a sign or anything else. So I chose a number of interesting morphologies uh, from the uh, uh, timing catalog of Mazer et al. Uh, that are worthy of following up. TTVs that are parabolic, meaning that we don't know yet what they are. TTVs that are chaotic, which is uh, almost exclusively long period planets. And periods that are TTVs that are appear to be already sinusoidal, but they are just and uh, not the, you don't even see a second period, so the super period is not yet well characterized. The problem is that there are many such life curves around 60 kW wise. There are many of them that are long period and long, very long transits. And we need at least a one meter telescope to follow up because we started with a one meter space telescope to begin with the, the, the initial data. So that was a, quite a problem when I approached Carolina von S and asked her if she could follow up on a few of these objects and ask her if she would be willing to do that. What I underestimated is that Carolina von Essen has lots of friends. And currently what we have is a network of quite a few telescopes. The blue dots are telescopes that are donating time, and just uh, because they are nice. And the red dots are the telescopes that are for which we compete for, tel for time regularly through tax. And indeed our network, the KOI net, is a global network of one meter telescopes to follow up on the TTVs of selected KOIs. Uh, we have uh, we had a, a small problem how to um, distribute the, all these targets between the, the over 20 telescopes, and the, our criteria is such that we have a model for the pre expected precision of a given target on a given telescope, and so we require that any new observation will be at least three sigma significant timing wise, which means it will actually give us more information on the timing signal. It will not be just the transit, but huge error bars on the timing, and it will not advance us forward on the, uh, our quest for TTV and uh, characterization. We had a rough start, somewhere between 10 or 15, I don't remember, first times that we, people went to the telescopes, we were caught with bad weather. But finally, it's over, and now we are taking data, and here we can see the red points are Kepler data and the purple points are round-based data following up uh, on this first uh, analysis. And we are on our way. If you want to learn more, you can go, go to the website and learn more. Everything you know about the network. So, to conclude, Kepler 9 showed us that it is very advantageous to increase the baseline of your observations. It's non-linear. It's very adv advantageous. Kepler 117 taught us that when you do have long baseline observations, you, ca you can start seeing other effects like barycentric motion TTVs that start to become important. KYNet tries to increase the baselines of those KYs that are already known to worthy of follow, follow up in these cases. And if you have a one meter telescope, please uh, join KYNet, come to me, come later, and we are accepting new members all the time. Uh, larger TTVs exist out of mean motion resonances, which is not was what was seen till today. And, and when long baselines exist, uh, TTVs are the rule, not the exception, because multiplicity is the rule. When you have long baselines and lots of planets, and indeed Kepler showed us that there are, most systems are multiple, you will have TTVs eventually. I will leave you with the TTVs of the solar system as it would be observed by an external observer. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah, questions? Uh, one, one thing I didn't understand, you said Jupiter has a seven hour TTV or the Earth has a seven hour TTV? If you had a 50, hour, 50 year light curve of the solar system from somewhere else, you would see that the Earth has a seven hour TTV because of Jupiter with a period of 12 years or so. Uh, and, and what effect does that really? What do you mean? What what, what because is the sun wobbles on the sky. No, but that can't be seven hours because uh, this light from the sun to the earth needs only eight minutes. No, we are talking about motion on the fa on the on on the plane of the sky, not along not not the motion radial motion motion on the sky. The left right motion basically yes. of the sun versus okay. the the sun wobbles roughly its size. Yeah. If yeah. you divide the size with all the yeah, velocity yeah. of Earth, you get seven mm -hmm. hours. So these 60 planets which you selected for follow-up TTV studies, 
Yeah. How long are the transits and how uncertain are the predictions? I mean, do these fit into one night of telescope time quite easily? Do these fit do, what? Do, if you get one transit, does that fit nicely into a, a single night of telescope time? Or is this something you've got to observe using the whole network for, say, 24 hours? Well, uh, some of these transits are 18 hours long, so for them, no. Uh, but uh, some of the TTVs are so big that any timing point, even timing that is, you just see an egress or an egress, uh, which obviously have a larger error, will be so important because you have either very few points, or B, the TTVs are so large, there are objects with TTVs of a day. So any new point, any precision, will be valuable. Sorry. Um, so for the system, I forgot which, which Kepler one it was, uh, with the three frequencies in the O minus C diagram? Yes, um, You two. said you didn't really have an explanation for that. Uh, no, we, tr we tried. Uh, we tried mod modeling the, tried really hard modeling the system in an analytical explanation. We, we obviously have an N-body fit. Okay, let it be clear. We have an N-body fit, which fits nicely. But we would like to have some kind of intuition as to why we get specifically three frequencies that are exactly the period of the outer planet and its two first, first two harmonics. And for that, I only have explanation for the first frequency. Yes. So, I, I guess I, you've confused me. So, are you saying that those two masses B and C are responsible for all three of those frequencies that you see in the O minus C diagram. Well, a you should you should I see no reason I see no reason to add another component to the system. You see, the end body fit with these three objects, the star two planets, fits nicely. Okay, all right. So I, I just misunderstood what you were saying in your talk. So, so there is you don't need yet another body to help explain the O minus C diagram. No, it's a question. I, I didn't hear it yet. You don't need another body. Okay, thank you. Okay, any further questions? No, then let's continue with the next talk by Juan Cabrera.